So Rewind was the first international TF2 event to take place in North America. That was the first time a European team of high skill traveled to a land outside of Europe. It was the first quote unquote major in North America in TF2. And it was also sort of the maiden voyage of Seven as a, as a brand. This iteration of the, the TF2 team, formerly known as Crowns, Reason, Nerd Rage, that's now Seven. It was not only their first LAN, but it was also their first uh, match ever as a team, actually. After we won season 25, there was kind of sort of like a little downtime before Rewind was announced, and the whole Seven project kind of became like a reality. We didn't really know about that until, I think, early December, maybe? For the LAN, we were playing online a lot, um, generally mainly against the same opponents who were playing a similar playstyle to us, uh, because we were dominant force in Europe for a long period of time, and previously won I-58. It was like a big change, because obviously season 25 with Crowns wasn't a great season for me, so the whole like shift of like mentality and, and like attitude towards the game was, for me, really great, because I finally got the chance to kind of like fit into this this team of like really solid players who had gone on to win like a championship. Well even at I-58 we thought we could win, like we could take the tournament and that carried all the way through till Rewind. As long as they were competitive it was a success for me. Um, realistically my expectation going in was that I probably thought they would come second mainly due to time constraints. Uh, there was just so many factors that were unsure like how was Ali going to take to take to uh, a leadership role in an actual, in actual real, in a real team. Um, how was Ams going to do in a in a real team? Could Thalash adapt to the pocket role properly? But when we got Stark, I mean, you could count on Stark. I could count on Drac, and I can count on Raymond. But the other three were all like relatively new tools for me to work with. So realistic expectations were second, but I felt like anything was possible, to be honest. It was a six week like build up to the event from team conception to <clears throat> tournament. So the idea was we were going to learn probably as much in that week, or they were going to learn as much in that week as they would have done in the entire like process leading up to it. But I don't think that exactly happened. Uh, because we got too much, too stuck into specific like details and it's hard to like develop that much when you're literally just getting rolled repeatedly. I think we had a lot higher expectations going to it, like in terms of practicing, getting a better feel for the teams um, and getting more warm to the game. <clears throat> the only team to ever try and bootcamp before was the various Australian teams. Uh, they always had really bad, like big bad hurdles to overcome. I mean. Seven, our monitors weren't great for the bootcamp, but we at least had functioning computers, internet connection, and uh, decent access to our accommodation. Uh, the other teams to try and bootcamp in TF2 before always had absolutely unplayable conditions. But for us, we had a realistic opportunity to to have a real, like, like a flourishing bootcamp. I do think we underperformed. I think for some players, it may be kind of affected them a bit more than others with the, the whole setup, um, playing on safety hurts and... So our end result from the bootcamp was we won two of the games and lost about nine. Um, out of that, I mean, I feel like we learned a lot as a team. So I don't feel like it was a negative experience at all. It was the opposite completely. Stark's time in the bootcamp was, uh, was very rough. He had a harder time Compared to others adjusting to like 60 hertz, he, I think his eyesight's not very good, so he had like a harder time sort of like tracking people on the monitor. Um, he kind of lost track of people, which you usually do on 60 hertz, especially if you're playing like a hit gun class like Scout. This is fucking stupid. I mean, do you want me to be asleep or not? 
He sort of bailed one night, like a few months, we were going to play one or two maps extra against the Australians and he was like, I've had enough and he went. In a very sketchy neighbourhood, he decided to walk home to, a, to our hotel. But that was a bit worrying because uh, yeah, he could have he got shot or something. So. And then that's sort of a really good player in our team that's not present anymore. Yeah, the fact that we lost almost every game, I think it was a good thing for us, to be honest, because it actually made us focus on our mistakes and focus on what we needed to change. Even in the Sochi match, I don't feel like that made any difference. Like, it was still sort of nothing of substance to me. Get onto that. And Yuli's just mowing oh people down. God. He's got a lawnmower. He's just slamming. They were like grass before him. I don't think they got as much out of it in terms of learning TF2 as they could have done. I think Haffy Cool once said about I-55 that he learned more in that weekend than he would learn in an entire season playing online. So that was kind of the objective we had going in. Uh, even though we were getting crushed, it didn't really matter to us. I think we all knew that it's all just like a learning curve. We're kind of getting adjusted to the whole like environment and playing together as a team on LAN. No, no matter what was going on, no matter which part of the tournament it was, I think we still had the ability to crush everyone. Yeah, so I was doing analysis for the production team as well as like coaching. But I saw pretty much everything because I kind of shirked my responsibilities as an analyst. I mean, what I saw in the regular, in like the, in the main bulk of the tournament was sort of like a continual development. And there was like various, I think, crucial points in that development that led to essentially what, was, what I see as a large turnaround in their fortune from arriving in America on the Tuesday to the eventual culmination of the tournament. After coming out of the boot camp, I was, I was feeling quite happy with how we, how we sort of looked at things. And just the first game straight up, we just, we just lost. Um, but the games after that sort of crawled back up again. I stopped, not stop, but the point at which I started to believe, okay, things are going to be okay, and this is going to go okay, was their game against Jasmine T in groups, because that was a team that had been wrecking them for a week solid, and not only was it a pretty big deal to like win convincingly against them, overturning that when it actually counts, I think that probably was one of the most important things they did. After losing to them for three days straight in the boot camp, it was very satisfying, and it led us on to a nice day. And considering that was the map that the previous Crowns team had lost to, to them at like 58. We felt, I guess, pretty good about our product. We also felt good about our product before. That was sort of like a confidence boost saying that, okay, these guys have been wrong this in the boot camp, but when it actually comes to it, we can beat them on their best map. As it went on, I think we got like our feel. We, we were playing our game. EVL were probably the only thing that stopped us in our tracks for a little while. EVL was the only team other than Froyo that they really faced I mean, it's really literally the only team they faced in best of threes. I mean, the thing that will always stand out to me was Drax's performance in the first series against EVO. Uh, 45, I think, kills on Viaduct for Aroma is ridiculous.
it was a vital like peak for him to have because later on in the tournament, like other players started arriving, like Ams improved progressively, Thalash improved progressively. Drax trajectory was certainly like maybe he peaked too early, you could say, but it was necessary that he did to progress the team through the tournament. I think all of the all of my big players actually were against EVL. We were losing three one at the point, and then we made a comeback uh, coming up to four three. That game I hit forty five frags. I'm pretty sure that was the best TF2 I've ever played before. It's quite yeah, it's quite crazy to think if that was on in on Europe, we would have actually lost the game there and then against EVL. In a way, like personally, I think it was better like to have Viaduct pushed to that limit. But you, you still can't deny that if we we were playing like you know. I-58 I or I-61, we would have definitely lost and we would have been out of the tournament. Well, but listen, if you're wondering who we're going to be looking at first, uh, well, the first thing we've got coming up is a banger, if I may say. We've got a best of three series between Seven and between Froyotech. What do you think is in the minds of these teams? Yeah, so for Seven, it's just going to be forgetting about this, the last series of yesterday. They had a really tough game against EVL. A lot of the things they work on on a day-to-day -day basis kind of went out of the game, and it was just a grind. Like, they've been away, they've checked what happened, and I think they're very confident that they know what they want. Starkey, can he decloak and make it? Nursey on the staircase, he's going to decloak. Here it comes. Can he make the play for his team? He's oh, oh, my God. Oh, oh, my God. God. oh, my God! Oh, my God, Starkey! Froyotech are looking to make it 2-0 here in this upper bracket final, in this best of three. That's huge. That's got to feel good there. Froyotech remaining undefeated in this tournament. Yeah, and congratulations to Froyotech there. They're going to be moving on to the grand finals. Seven will There's something about the way they played this event that really struck me was how sort of hype-based they became. Because Crowns as a team, particularly, well, when I was playing and when I was like in-game coaching, the mantra of the team was always calm down. Like, I don't want people shouting, I don't want people getting excited too early. These guys were not the best team at this event, just in terms of play for play. So we kind of deliberately ditched being calm and went for the exact opposite and just like full scale, like bringing people literally behind them to yell. And uh, they weren't playing well enough to just rely on being the best team. They had to have something like extra. We got knocked out from the upper bracket final um, and then we had to play against EVO again. Um, in the lower bracket final, which meant, yeah, it was a win or lose situation. Um, so on the second map, we played Badlands, and um, I think that might go down in TF2 history as a, a slow game. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen both of the teams playing already today, and they've both played fantastically. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Seven probably has the upper hand overall, but yeah. if EVL can adjust their playstyle to a more defensive style, I think they do have a chance at taking down Seven and making it to the all North American Grand Finals. Ooh. Pops up running here. They need to find Cookie Jake. They're actually just getting out on the point. Oh, he's on the heavy course trying to get on it, but Allie's doing so much damage. Allie, three kills with a pipe. What happened? What was it? Your unadulterated stress. <laughs> I imagine it was very, very boring to watch. Badlands, like, the constant back and forth nature. The most vivid memory I have of that map is I got bombed about six times in a row by, uh, I think it was Garbuglio. Um, and every time it fouled, just constantly over and over again, just, like, wasting time thinking about a spy. Another team really wanted to make a risk. And, he, and even though EVL criticizes for that, like, saying, like talking about our play style, they were doing the same thing. 
So yeah, we, we won that map with a 1-0 after watching Resup for 25 minutes. And then we go into the grand final for, to try and get back to our revenge. We are getting set for this grand final. The, uh, the big mama of the event. It all has come down to this. It's the number one and two seeds. It's Froyotech and Seven. This is the match that everyone wanted, right? Mm -hmm. NA versus EU, a chance to see the regions go head to head to see who's gonna be the best. Um, the first map that we're gonna play, uh, we're playing actually some of the more rare maps. We're playing Sunshine first and then Viaduct, followed by Gullywash. Interesting. What do you think of Sunshine Viaduct right out of the gate? Well, I mean, it, historically, Froyo... Uh, so I went over with Drac to do the map vetoes, and the tournament organizers then informed us that they'd actually misinformed us previously of how the final veto system would go. We were under the impression we'd have a ban, so we hadn't really factored in Sunshine. Uh, but apparently, yeah, it was just straight picks, and then whatever maps weren't picked were not picked. Uh, there was no bans, so that was a surprise, but... It was really important that they didn't really make a big deal about it. Kind of talked over it briefly, learned the rollouts and stuff in the in the warm up, and Ali just said, "Okay, listen, guys, uh, if everyone just listens to me and we do it, it'll either fail or it'll work, and we can kind of play off that." Wow. Slowly but surely wins the race for seven, and they're going to be moving in with the sticky placement, trying to put in a bit of work. Paddy in the back lines, just making magic happen. Falash does go down to Blaze. AMS on the follow up. Mercy falling to Stark as well. Drac just cleaning up. Can anything stop this EU squad on this map? It really, really does not seem so. Yeah, you thought that was it? And it felt great. That was really like the map that brought us into the game and made us feel like we are going to win this because we were almost convinced before we even started that map that Froyotech were going to destroy us with all their previous experience on it. So that was a pretty big factor and that was actually the first point in the tournament I genuinely believed they could win. Not because I actually put too much stock into the Sunshine win, because I actually, I felt like at the time I had a pretty good read on what this was. This was expectation versus no expectation. It was one team playing free and loose because they knew they had no, no expectation on the map. Getting off to a rough start, that was going to have a big impact on them. But I knew come second map, these factors were gone. It was going to be back to like a reset. Froyo still have, you know, it's a best of five. It makes a big difference. Yes, welcome back indeed to map number two that's going to be kicking off in a moment's notice. It's going to be Viaduct, the King of the Hill map, and it's going to be an interesting one at that. The cast has mentioned they can't quite wrap their heads around why Seven would pick this into Froyotech when it was a traditionally uh, quite a heavy map uh, in their favor for Froyo in the past. But I mean, in recent times with roster changes and such, um, clearly Seven think differently. Because we had a pretty good idea of how like, Froyo played on, on Product with the way they've kind of let the soldiers do most of the work. Uh, kind of opening up uh, fights for them. We would win the fight, but we would just lose 20, 30 seconds in the process every single time, and that just lost us rounds. Myself especially, I felt like I couldn't do anything in that map. They locked down the flank the entire game. There were just moments where if the fight was just a little bit closer to the point, it would have made a whole difference. We probably would have won that map in a much more convincing fashion than we actually lost it. We didn't get rolled. Although, the score would say we did. I think we lost 4-1, but it came down to like these small mistakes that we just kept on making. Sending it straight into the air! Nursey just in the nick of time, finding that kill. In the meantime... Sarki's getting on the point, he meets shots, man, he takes him down, two shots, first round, four seven. Well, which has always been a good map for us, and uh, we ended up winning that 2-1 in the Golden Cup. Uh, and then moving on to Snakewater, which was, we ended up getting rolled 5-0, uh, or 4-0, which was a bit of a shock to us, because I think none of us expected to win Sunshine, so Snakewater would have been the map we should have taken to kind of take the series. In my mind, it ended up like sort of a reverse situation where we thought we were going to lose Sunshine and probably win Snakewater. But instead, it was the other way around. And 
I felt like Snakewater was the map that we were going to take the series, but oddly enough, we just we just lost. We just got destroyed. Wow. They're not doing the capture time. There's some nice rockets, but they didn't focus the point. They're coming in on the flank here. Is Raymond going to be ready for it? Banny and Blaze. Banny gets oh. one kill. Blaze gets another. Banny oh. gets two. from underneath, they're getting very aggressive with that Uber. Danny, look how deep he is. He still has a full stack of health and he's just capping off the point so much Great time. Flash. Nursey flashing her pocket scout and Vanny just runs on the point once again before any friend Yeah, we, had, just, we just crashed out. Don't really know what happened. Uh, we knew Froyo had a really good, good grasp on Snake Water. They were obviously a pretty good Snake Water team. Ended up losing 4-0, although I believe it was like 3-0 for the majority of the time, and then we sort of realized, okay, this map is lost. Let's, uh, let's focus on Granary. I feel like it probably would have been worse for us if it had been like a, a close, like Golden Cap loss in Snakewater. We probably would have had a worse mindset going into Granary. Uh, the only thing I remember from the Snake was Snakewater game was like getting destroyed, and then I double a shot blaze on like in kitchen or mid, and that was like, that's, that's the only thing I remember. It was starting to take a toll, toll on us though, like all the games we played on that one day. But going into it, we were sure like we were still were able to win. The motivation was still there. We're getting ready for Granary. This is an interesting thing because we talked about the map vetoes off the top. Granary, historically, is not Froyo's map. And they, it, when we looked earlier at the vetoes, they vetoed and banned it all the way down the line. But the very last map that was picked ended up being Granary. If we upset Froyo on a map, it was always Granary. That was always yeah. the go-to. So, I mean, Banny has been off and on. The last game was a good one for him, but I mean, the, the influence of the map being so soldier heavy could definitely affect his stats again. Previously, when we played Frotech on Granary beforehand, we had a, a strat which involved a pyro um, on, on second, pushing onto their second, but it, it just didn't work. So we brought it out again in the grand final for the last game, um, but this time we had a pyro and a spy. All that Seven can do is at best tie. And Mercy's positioning uh, is just fantastic here on the top left of the battlements. Starkey coming in, he meets Nursey. Nursey with her Uber, she's gonna hold on to it. Oh! Stunk manages to drop Nursey just with a pistol, like misses the stab, but then just shoots, shoots the medic to death. And then we have about 30 seconds to push into last. The final, I think, 20 seconds when we were pushing in left side to last, I just remember like, like, Sort of a heat coming over me thinking we have no time left we have this final push we have these last seconds to like make or break the situation oh, it's over they need to get on the point right now Frodo Tech counting down the seconds until their victory party looks like seven trying to make some space down the deep left side there's a level one sentry there for banny and he goes down and try the sentry guy gets a frag here comes the Uber. they need to get on the point right now five four that's it three two one it's over Froyotech is your champions. They come back and win it all. Froyotech are victorious, winning the final best of five, three to two over seven. What an incredible finish. It was right down to the wire, but Froyotech held on strong. What an incredible... Time ran out and I realized like, you know, wait, our time was up. We lost. They just set up a set up a sentry, set up a heavy, and then that was, that was pretty much it. We just tried to take take control of, of the last, but we just can get it in time. Looking back at it, it was, I feel like we probably could have won it. I mean, we, again, we have, I think we have the better like individual players and. The goal wasn't ever really to win from my perspective. They will be, they are, they were gutted that they lost. To lose in such a fashion takes its toll on anyone. Um, but for me, the goal was never really to win. The success of seven at Rewind was never, do we win the tournament or not? It's like, what mark do we leave on the tournament? We were the first European team to go to America and 
that with that came a lot of responsibility. For sure, Seven were the most memorable team of this event. Um, maybe only Banny would disagree with that. I think the best thing for me really for the natural event was just the like the American community meeting the Americans it was I thought like it was really good um or 20B or of like me market as well they were, they were really cool guys EVL like seeing the the American community there as well like supporting supporting us in the same way the European community like supports the Americans when they come over here as well it's I think it's, it was really cool to see Losing was crushing because over so much time, I just built up in my mind that we were number one. Like all the effort we made to go there, like the fundraiser, the, the fly out to California, you know, we put so much effort into just getting there. And yeah, it was, it was sad really at the end. Going to Rewind was definitely worth it. Like a lot of people put in a lot of work to, to sort of make it happen for us. But I was really excited to go. Like traveling across the pond to, to, to compete in a video game is always uh, a nice thing to do, especially if if you, have, if you think you have a shot at winning the, like the whole tournament, it's, it feels good to go. And shout out to my team. Shout out to everyone who helped us attend Rewind. Shout out to all the eSports Arena staff. Big shout out to Wade for driving me home. After a, uh, after a 20 banger that went, went bad. <laughs> uh, it's a shame because it would have been like probably the greatest TF2 story if they, if they had won, but I suppose the way we look at it is it's not the end of the story yet. Um, there will be another international LAN. There will be another seven team there. It won't be exactly the same team, but it will be, it will be the, the next chapter in the seven story. We'll have most of the same players and they'll, they'll come back stronger and they'll go again. I mean, we can say they didn't have much time to prepare for Rewind, so we can remove that variable from the equation and yeah, they'll come back stronger. But uh, I think Jasmine T, if you uh, look at all the hard evidence, there's, some, there's a few things to correlate there, unfortunately.
put you in this one. <laughs>